Welcome back to Raised by Giants Discussion. We are live. Welcome, everyone, in the chat. Good to see you guys and any moderators or channel members out there today. We have a never-before-done combo here this evening with Wayne Stagger and Ryan Gable here with us today. And, man, do I love doing things that's never been done before. But before I bring them on for what I know is going to be an amazing conversation, a shout-out to my Buy Me a Coffee supporter. Someone had a contribution last week over there and they wanted to remain anonymous but thank you for your support to the show someone anyone that contributes to help support the show on buy me a coffee or paypal will get a shout out uh, on the next live from the time that i received the contribution i appreciate appreciate each and every single one of you guys that have contributed to the show whether that means financially or being in the chat, hitting the thumbs up button or leaving a comment uh, or being a channel member, you might not think that those things matter, but they do. Hitting the thumbs up button tells YouTube that you want to see more of my content. Leaving a comment creates engagement, and the more engagement, the more the channel gets pushed. So thank you, everyone, not only to the viewers, but uh, for the likes and the comments and sharing of my videos. It really does make a difference. And, of course, uh, to those who are Rider Ranger channel members, Thank you very much. So with that down, we have an amazing little panel here today with returning guests to the show, but uh, have never before been together. And first up, we have philosopher, researcher, educator, spiritual teacher, and visionary on occult and esoteric studies, Wayne Steiger. It's good to see you, my friend. How is it going? Good to see you, my friend, Ryder. Good to be here, and thank you for the invite. Yes, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion here today. I'm a little under the weather, but uh, we're going to make it through here. Next up is author and producer of the show, The Secret Teachings, and my good friend, Ryan Gable. Welcome back to the show, my friend. How's it going? It's going good, Ryder. Thanks for having me on the show. Yes, and so the other day, gentlemen, we're just going to jump right into it. I was pondering on this concept and this idea of heaven and to any analytical person, you know, would do, I, I thought to myself, where did this concept of heaven come from? Because it, it's always heavily referenced in Christianity. And I'm pretty sure that's where everyone has heard of this concept of heaven from. But I knew that the oldest religion in the world is Hinduism which dates back over 5,000 years and that Hindus believe in reincarnation and reincarnation based off of karma. So it couldn't have come from <clears throat> Hinduism. So my question that I guess that I pose to both of you is did this concept of an afterlife or the concept of heaven come from Christianity or is there an older religion or an older teaching that dates back further than Christianity have this concept of an afterlife and heaven? Uh, Wayne, if you want to start. Yeah, I, I think it's solely a um, Christian theology. Um, you know, prior to that, if you look at the Egyptians, they had their belief of a afterlife and the underworld, but the idea of heaven itself is a Christian um, concept because that's your reward for going to heaven. You know, you're going to have eternal peace and whatever that is, although I do find it interesting. The Bible really doesn't talk a lot about heaven. Paul wrote about it, but in the Old Testament, the uh, Hebrews did not believe in a heaven. Right, and it's interesting too because the, the Old Testament doesn't really even reference a heaven or a, or a hell. So if they didn't believe in heaven or hell, then what exactly do they believe in? Ryan, what do you got? Well, I agree with Wayne, first of all. I think it's primarily a Christian concept. But when I say it is a Christian concept, I think the question is what is it because everybody – has their own interpretation of what heaven is and, you know and wayne's also right that you have the concept of the underworld and you find that in egypt famously but you also find that in mesoamerica zibulba 
You find that in Japan. I like to talk about the East because that's not very well known about in the West. The land of Yomi in Japan was the land of the underworld. And very, they had very similar stories to the Egyptians and to the Mesoamericans as well. So from Mesoamerica all the way to the land of the rising sun, you have this underworld concept, which I suppose you could, depending on how you interpret it, interpret it as both a heaven or a hell-like state, because you went through the underworld in order to either be reborn as a star or to transcend and maybe to be reborn again into a physical body, which was a was a, I think that was an original tenet of Christianity was reincarnation. So I agree with Wayne in those ways. And just to expand a little bit, that's, that's my thoughts. But I do want to add one more thing that in the Hindu belief system, there is a place or I guess a, a state of being called, and I don't speak Sanskrit, but it's something to, to the pronunciation of Zivarga, Zivarga, S-V-A-R-G-A. And that's like the seventh heaven. In, or they call it the lokas, which is like a, a plane or a state of being, um, which is also similar in the in the Kabbalah with Kether, the crown. And it's also something that you find with the seven classical planets. And you find that with the seven, um, what they call the seven garments of Ishtar and also the seven garments of Izanagi in Japan. So these are concepts that are universal um, and those, I guess those are my opening thoughts on, on your question. Isn't yeah. there a trinity of the Kabbalah that has uh, Cathar in it, the like Cathar, Chokma, and Banar? Isn't that the trinity of the Kabbalah? Oh, yes, yes. For a second, I thought you were saying something else. Uh, I believe off the top of my head, I think. And that's the same with uh, Brahma and Vishnu. Vishnu. Yeah, and, yeah, so that's there's the Shiva. Trinity and Shiva, the destroyer, but the destroyer is also the, allows for new things to be born and birth. So it's like a cyclical necessary evil, but yeah, that's in Hinduism. It's, it's all over the world. It's in us like, you know, birth, life and death, etc. Yeah. That's really interesting. And this, this concept of heaven and hell in the old Testament, nowhere in the old Testament does it say that when you die, you go to heaven or hell. So if there wasn't a concept of heaven and hell for the Old Testament people, <clears throat> then that means that heaven and hell is a relatively new concept. Would you agree with that, Wayne? Yeah, it's kind of like the, do you have a soul or do you have a spirit? Do you have a spirit and a soul? And uh, <clears throat> when I think of heaven, of course, in Bible school, you know, we were, Paul wrote about it. He said there were seven levels of heaven, mirroring much around the world, Ryan, as you were pointing out. And the thing that I think about heaven is, well, what is the purpose of heaven? I mean, what does it serve? Hell is the concept that we had from Dante, and the church grabbed a hold of that because that was the perfect control that they needed to keep basically the peasants in line. Yeah, Hajmunch says here that no hell mentioned in the Old Testament. Well, I mean, it's kind of referred to, uh, uh, what is that word there? Sheol? Sheol. 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 Yeah, it's like referred to as the pit, mm -hmm. though I, I, I believe. So kind of, I guess, depending Actually, on your translation. it was the 12th gate in the city of Jerusalem was the pit, Guiana. And it's where they took all the refuge of the city, and that's where it was burnt, and it burned all the time. Do you know what side of the city that was on? Was that west? I believe it was. <laughs> <laughs> the land of death where Ra's sunboat would crash each night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Actually, don't tell me that. You know, the the west. <laughs> I think every culture has that, too. I think, um, I mean, from the Egyptians, famously, yeah. they have the land in the West, but I was even, uh, I think it's in Japan too. Japan has this legend about a mystical Island that it's uh, in the it, Tibetan book and the dead as well. Oh, it is. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's always in the West, but that's because that's where the sun dies mm -hmm. each night and becomes the black sun. You know, I think that the question that you're asking writer can be looked at from more of a psychological point of view. And based on what Wayne is saying, I think we should expand on Dante's version of hell because Dante's version of hell is quite contradictory to the church's version of hell. Dante's depiction 
and you could look this up if you wanted to show an image of it, uh, look up Ice Palace, Hell, Dante. Dante described, and I think it was 33 or 34 uh, of his, of his uh, story that Hell is actually an ice palace and that the devil or this devilish character is actually physically encased in ice. So I've always looked at Hell as being sort of like, and I wrote this in my occult book, I've always looked at hell as being kind of a place where it's a state of mind. Like when you're betrayed or when you don't feel loved, you feel really cold, you feel really alone, you feel really cold. But when you feel loved, when you feel appreciated, you feel really warm. You can feel the light. That's kind of how heaven would be described. And then likewise, purgatory is the state between those two states of awareness where you're really uncertain whether maybe you're in a situation where you, you haven't made up your mind about something, you're kind of in a state between feeling warm and feeling cold. That, that would be another, I think, uh, interpretation of it. Yeah, there, that, there, the one in the middle there that you had, that was uh, the, the ice palace of hell. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that you bring up this, uh, this purgatory um, idea because from my understanding, that is what the Old Testament people believed happened when you died mm -hmm. they believed in purgatory they well, that, called it abraham's side or abraham's bosom which um is referenced in luke uh 16 22 i believe and what, uh go ahead no i was going to say if you look in what is it in the book of samuel uh saul king saul when he called upon the witch of endor and it's one of the few references in the Old Testament that we know that there is this afterlife. It also shows that this witch had the ability to communicate to the dead. And what the ancient prophet told Saul was that, why did you disturb me? And apparently it's a very grayish place. Uh, it's apparently a place where the spirits or the souls rest. So it's very interesting when you take that concept and you try to play it into the heaven and hell role, it doesn't jive. Yeah, in purgatory, the original word is Latin, purgatorius, and it means the translation in Latin is purifying. So when you apply the idea of purgatory to the gates of Ishtar or the descent of Inanna or the story of Izanagi going into the underworld to rescue his wife Izanami in Japan, when he comes out of the underworld unclean, he goes to a river and he strips off all of his garments and purifies himself in the river. And when he does that, he then gives birth to the sun goddess Amaterasu. So from the underworld, or what we might call hell, to the purifying of the river and losing the garments, to, which is just like Ishtar and Inanna, to the birth of the sun goddess, you have this transition, you know, hell, purgatory heaven in a sense in that old Japanese story. And that's essentially what purgatory is. It's the purifying of the soul. I believe it was Meister Eckhart, the German mystic who said that if we learn to, we learn to understand that this is a paraphrase. We learn to understand that angels and demons kind of play the same part, that demons feed off of the negative things that we feel and the weightful emotions, like in the hall of judgment in Egypt, that would be consumed by the by the great beast so those demons actually feed off those things and they're doing the work of the angels if you will because in order to reunite or to um, ascend if you will that's a really bad word to use nowadays but to ascend through the spheres of consciousness one has to be purified which is what purgatory is it's the state between in a sense between life and eternal life in the spirit realm does that make sense it does and <laughs> I want to bring up this uh, this verse really quickly because uh, I think that it's very important, which is Luke uh, sixteen twenty two, and here it is. It says, "The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, and lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom." And this verse is very interesting uh, because it's where the whole idea and the whole thought of what hell is 
really comes from. And how many times have we heard people talk about, oh, well, when you go to hell, you'll you'll be able to see God, but not be able to do anything about it. That comes from this verse. And well, what uh, I find interesting on this verse is that a, if, if you really study the scriptures, is that it's it's mixing two different theologies here. It's robbing from the Hebrew culture because I contend Christianity has no God. You can't tell me who the Christian God is. But in here, Jesus would have never said this. Jesus was a rabbi. He would not have had the concept of a hell. He would have understood Abraham, and 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 you know the story goes on that there's this great chasm between Abraham and the rich man Lazarus. I think is the other story. So it's very interesting how the mind trap starts right here from the get go. Two different theologies: one that was old, one that was being invented. It's also interesting here the distinction between the poor man. And the rich man. It's almost like if you're poor, then you're going to be saved. If you're rich, you're going to you're live in a world of <laughs> torment. <laughs> you know what I think you can relate that to? What what Luke or whoever wrote this book is saying is they're basically describing in different terms the Egyptian Hall of Judgment. In the Hall of Judgment, you had the heart and you had the feather that were weighed. The feather was the soul. The heart was the physical aspects of the of life. And if your heart was heavy or weightful with sin or with regret or with desire, the beast would eat it and you were not able to go into the next stage of the afterlife. So that that would be a man who is poor in a sense. And the man who is rich has no physical possessions, but is rich in spirit. The feather, therefore, is more weightful than the heart. And then you're able to transcend. I think that's what that's saying. I think so too, but it's just interesting in, in the, uh, the the words that they use to describe it. <laughs> I think it's a, definitely a metaphor, but uh, it's just interesting the, the the poor, the poor and the rich, right? because that's something that's been, you know, <laughs> propagated through Christianity. That if you have a lot of possessions, then you know God isn't really favoring you. If you very uh, you know, if you have a lot of things, if you have a lot of material possessions, then that's of the devil, right? It's almost it's almost Buddhist in a way. And I think that people have also politicized that because a lot of people take the Bible and say that because they say the book of Luke says something to that effect, they, they believe it's like an anti-capitalist message, which is in the same way that you can interpret the Bible and you can interpret you know, you can interpret a simple verse like that to mean some political thing. You could interpret it to mean that I have to be poor in order to go to heaven. You can interpret it as, as I do. I interpret it as being part of the ancient mystery tradition, uh, what the Egyptians taught in the in the underworld story. But you can interpret it in quite a few different ways. I don't think it's literal, <laughs> but to put it bluntly. I don't think it's literal. <laughs> you know, what's really interesting in this discussion is that I go back to the very beginning. So what came first? Was it the creation of this heaven, hell, death, or was it life? Because if you have the construct that there was a heaven and hell, who populated it? How did it start? How did it begin? And if you look at the whole concept of hell, of Satan, Lucifer, then hell has to be run by a woman because a woman would be the direct antithesis of the Hebrew God, mm -hmm. Yahweh, the he Elohim. So the whole concept of hell, when you begin to examine it, begins to crumble very quickly because what it's saying is that hell is run by women and because they would be the only ones that would accept God's rejects. And the mother of all demons is a, well, the, in the Jewish tradition is Lilith or Lamash. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so she yeah. would mother of all demons you know she just didn't fit into the catholic narrative but i think in the very beginning when they were still trying to figure out who the god of christianity is um you know they i think in one of the versions it may have been a woman but it still gets back to the whole idea so what was the purpose of this creation and if man came in after the scene then it's a setup it's a, it's a complete setup you know that if you take the idea of of the queen of the uh, queen of the underworld, 
which is something that you find in Greece very famously with uh, Persephone or Proserpina in Rome. And that's a concept you also find, again, in Mesoamerica. You find in Japan with Izanami, uh, the queen of the underworld, or the Scandinavians actually called her, funny enough, the Scandinavian name for the underworld goddess was Hel, H-E-L, translated to how we would pronounce it today, Hel. So the goddess or the queen of the underworld it was always a queen. It was always a woman. And usually that story is meant to be interpreted as an allegory and a metaphor for nature. So I don't, I'm sure that you guys both know this, but like Persephone is probably the most famous story. When she goes into the underworld, she's this young, beautiful woman. So she represents spring and summertime. She's defiled by the fall, which is represented by Hades, who rides the black horse. That is the horse of the end of the year, the coming of the, the, uh, the lifting of the veil, the apocalypse, the unveiling, and then the pale horse, which is the death of winter. So you have this beautiful young woman of spring and summer. She's kidnapped and raped and abused by Hades with the black horse who actually carries scales in some of the stories. And he takes her to the underworld. And when she goes to the underworld, Earth essentially dies. And because Demeter, her mother, is very saddened that her daughter has been kidnapped and, uh, and raped and abused. So she lets the crops die. And Zeus gets upset in the story because all mankind is going to die without food, without light. So eventually Zeus convinces her to, and convinces Hades to allow Persephone to go. The story goes that she eats food in the underworld, which you see, you see that movie, uh, Pan's Labyrinth, when Ophelia's yeah. told out to eat the food in the pale man's lair. That's purely Greek and Roman and other mythologies. So she, she eats a pomegranate seed, which often is also correlated to the apple in the Garden of Eden. And when she eats the pomegranate seed, she I think she eats a third or something like that of the, of the pomegranate. So she has to stay in the underworld that portion of the year. So she has to stay there roughly through the fall and the winter. And then when she comes back to life in the spring, everything blooms again because her beauty comes back to the world. So although she is essentially the queen of the underworld, she's also the queen of regeneration and rebirth, which is something we find in Egypt where, where Queen Isis has both white veils of purity where we get the wedding veil from in part and also black veils of mourning where we get the story of Cinder, the Cinder, Cinder's on her face, the Cinderella story. She's searching for her Prince Charming. So she's both a white and black goddess or queen in the same way that I think it's the Zohar, you have the black and white god and there's an agricultural aspect and element to all of this that's very important i think to the discussion of heaven and hell isn't it odd that the pomegranate also adorned the doors to the holy of the holies the very important temple hmm. <coughs> well my my am i still on yeah okay i'm good um it's interesting when we talk about you know these people going into hell because you know who else descended into hell? Jesus Christ. Whenever he died, he descended into hell for three days and then resurrected and then ascended into heaven, which people really leave that part of the story out for some reason. But wait a minute. He was crucified on a Friday and raised on a Sunday morning. That ain't three days. <laughs> Well, I'm just I'm just telling what the book said. I mean, you know, there ain't no three days there. Well, it was on maybe on the third day. Friday's a day, Saturday's on the third day. I guess depending on how you, how you it can't work. be no good. For, maybe good Thursday. I don't know. But they didn't sell enough fish, so I, I mean, maybe that's why I don't know. So I've actually heard some scholars suggest that that a lot of the stuff <laughs> in the Bible, fish and wine, is really just a bunch of marketing. <laughs> Well, what was it? Uh, Pope was it was it Pope Pius the Third who said, "Oh, how we've deceived the people in this this belief of Jesus that never you know existed." So, and and, and and today it's odd because it influences all of our culture. We're talking about heaven and hell. It's the great fear. Hollywood has made billions on you know personifying this place called hell. Yes. As a philosopher, I look at hell as probably the place where I'd want to be because I'd be very uncomfortable in heaven because I'm the problem child. I'm the person that when you see me, I'm, I'm someone said, the great question mark. 
you know, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I'm trying to look for this verse really quickly. I think it's Ephesians 4, 9 that says that uh, Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth. Well, I mean, the, the whole Jesus story, a lot of people say, well, it's just sun worship. Well, in a sense it is, but it's a little more complex than that. It's really kind of a mixture of both agricultural analogies, metaphors, and allegories. Like, uh, There's a whole bunch of stuff that gets put into the story that becomes the Jesus descending into the, into the hell story or the verse that you're looking for. In the same way that when Jesus transcends and goes up into heaven, that is a story that's also told all throughout the world in various different forms. So really the Jesus story isn't simplified in my, in my view as just, oh, it's just sun worship. No, it's far more than that. It's basically a mixture of what it seems like virtually every major culture on this planet. It's putting all this together. And I think that the church, and I think most people understand this and know this already, that the church was trying to take these ancient cult beliefs and basically make it easier for the people to accept this new state-sponsored religion by bringing those people that already have these beliefs into the Christian narrative because it was so similar to what they already believed. They just created a new version of it. Whether that's I mean, I point out that when Christianity <clears throat> came about, and I always figure about 375, 425, it was organized. That was also the beginning of the Dark Ages. Mm. And ever since this religion has populated through the world, it has brought the Dark Ages with it. I mean, the Babylonian Tumult says that the Goem are the slaves of the Jews and that Christianity is the curse of the Jews upon the Goem because yeah. the Hebrew God will never allow a Gentile in his presence. <laughs> they didn't write the story. I mean, that's what it says. And so you've got this false narrative where today in the Western world, we're convinced that this story actually is true, but actually we all know deep down that it most likely is not. So anyway. Which of course doesn't mean that many of the, the motifs and the, and the principles and whatnot that you find in Christianity aren't things that you should abide by or better ways to live your life. Like Christian principles, it's, it's a, probably a pretty good way to live, uh, objectively speaking. But that doesn't mean that Wayne's not right, which I agree with him that it's, and I think, I mean, the, the Muslims and the, and the Jews, that's one thing they agree on, that Jesus was not the son of God. That was a blasphemous thing. The Talmud, actually, if you read the Talmud, it says, I'm sure Wayne knows this, it says that anybody who, um, well, they refer to anybody who distresses Israel as being the chief which is a word that was used to describe basically um, detractors of the rabbis and detractors of, of the, of the uh, I guess, the elites uh, in the rabbinical class. And they said that anybody who does that, which included Jesus, who they said was a wicked sorcerer from who learned magic in Egypt, who claimed blasphemously to be the son of God, that he would burn eternally in excrement. I think it's like track 57A or 57B of the Talmud. It actually... People yeah, say it right. that doesn't say that. No, it does say that. You can just yeah, look it up. It does. I just taught on this a couple of weeks ago. So it's very Rabbi Fuchs, when I was looking to convert to Judaism after our third meeting, he just looked at me and he says, Do the Jews a favor, don't convert. Because <laughs> <laughs> their opinion of the 12 apostles that they were the 12 devils, the 12 rebels that destroyed Jerusalem. That's yeah. how the Jewish people view Christianity. It was those 12 so-called apostles that were the ones then the blame for bringing down their, um, their whole society. Yeah, I think it's just a couple tracts or verses after the feces comment where is this guy named Ankelos. I don't know how to pronounce the name. You know that? Is it Ankelos? Do you know that name? Oh, you're close. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Ankelo, something like that. I'd be speaking in tongues, you know. <laughs> That's what it feels like. So he, he wants to convert to Judaism. And he goes to some of the higher ups and asks, and, and they and he basically the story goes, he goes and actually performs necromancy. It literally literally says this in the Talmud. He performs necromancy to resurrect Jesus from hell or from the dead. And then he asks Jesus. 
what do you make of these Jews? Like, that's what he's asking. And Jesus says, well, he said, you should not seek their misfortune, but you should seek their guidance and protection. Like, you basically, you should convert to Judaism, I think, is, is essentially what Jesus tells him. And the guy says, okay, well, what if I don't? What if I choose to go my own way? And he says, well, then you will be punished the way that I was punished. And he says, well, how, was, how were you punished? And he says, you, you will burn eternally in boiling excrement if you do something that the Jews don't like. So I find it really ironic. And I know that's one section of the Talmud. It's very large and you can take things out of context, but I, and the same with the Bible or the Quran. But, you know, Christians and Muslims believe a lot of the same things. And yet the media and our society have them neck to neck, cutting each other's heads off all the time. And there's extremist groups, of course, in both. But for the Christians to be so hell bent, no pun intended, on supporting the Jews and supporting Israel, when the Jews on average don't really support Christians and actually see the Christians as blasphemous themselves and say actually all the, in the Talmud it says all the followers of Jesus will be punished in that way. It's weird because the Muslims believe virtually what the Christians believe with the exception that Jesus is the son of God. I've always said Christians have far more in common with Muhammad and Allah and Muslims than they do with the Jews. I'd agree with that. Dr. Charles, in his book of the historical Jesus, pointed out that he felt that it was the Vatican in eight, 800, right around there, that they were the ones that also helped start the uh, Islamic religion. Mm. Interesting. I've never heard that. Um, I'll check. And, and after the show, I'll, I'll send you the book on the reference of it. It was that well, because it, it allowed uh, Rome to have the perfect corner on the market. Rome took the umbrella of the Abrahamic covenant as its own. So basically like almost like offering like one company that makes two or three different products, but they own them all. <laughs> they sell multinational. <laughs> <laughs> we serve everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Coke or Pepsi is basically what it is. <laughs> Here's this verse, true. this verse right here, Ephesians four, nine through 10. Now that he ascended, but what is it but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He that ascended is the same as the one that ascended up far above the all heavens that he might find or that he might fill all things. So, <laughs> and I think the, this is what the, the Old Testament people kind of believe that whenever Jesus was uh, crucified and died, then he freed the souls from hell. That's why he went to, he descended into hell. And then that made it to where people can enter into heaven. Make well, Jesus, I think what Jesus, in, in my view, I think Jesus, quote unquote, whatever you define that name because it's a title and it's more it's not yeast there was no jesus in the hebrew or even in the greek it was more like uh Jesus. it was more like zeus and translated from hebrew to greek Jesus. yeah Jesus, right from from hebrew to greek so there was no jesus never was but th there might have been many people that played a part like jesus in fact there certainly were because the romans actually well they usually did from what i understand the romans didn't crucify people usually for religious crimes they did for other crimes so it was kind of uncommon i don't know how true that is i didn't live in ancient rome so i don't know but <laughs> but from what i understand they didn't really usually crucify people for religious crimes so but there were people that certainly committed religious crimes whoever this jesus character was or many jesus characters because there were probably many of them that uh, whatever they had done they certainly had angered the roman establishment the roman authority they could have been more like political activists. I mean, if you were teaching that that Rome wasn't the, the 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 main authority in the land, I mean, that's enough to get you killed, probably. It's same as it would be today if you were in China or North Korea. It's a very similar kind of a thing. So, I, I don't know. I think what Jesus was teaching, in my view, or at least conceptually, what we can kind of pull out of the Jesus story, is he's teaching the mystery religions because when he raises Lazarus from the dead. That's the same story that we read about in the Egyptian temples and pyramids. It's yeah. raising someone physically from the dead, but they're not physically dead. Or they call it living resurrection. And so Jesus is showing you to go to hell and to come back. 
it's really in, in psychological terms or even in literature terms, it's kind of like the, the, the poems and the stories. I think they were like 16th century. I forget who wrote them and came up with the idea of the dark night of the soul. You go into yourself and that, that's, I think, what the Jesus story is all about. Going into hell, going into yourself, dealing with your demons, killing the dragon, slaughtering the beast, the animal sacrifice, and then transcending out of that and recognizing you're part of a much larger whole, i.e. heaven. And I think that's what the Jesus story is actually saying. In yeah, and then you have to weigh that with history. I mean, when I finally realized that the, the Jesus story was just that, it's a story, because history shows when the real character in the New Testament, in the first four Gospels, are actually the exploits of Vespasian. Now, Vespasian was real. We, we, we know what he looks like. We have a bust of him. And where the crucifixion story came from was because of his son Titus when he basically um, held siege to Jerusalem and allowed the Jews for the first time within uh, years to come and worship on the high holy days. And then Titus uh, sealed them in. And basically it was two million people that were uh, slaughtered. That was the fall of Jerusalem, and it was right after that that Titus went into the temple and took out the holy relics of the Hebrew worship. The three people that Titus did, in fact, crucify on the hill, uh, that story is actually true, but they were, as you pointed out, Ryan, they were actually rebels. They were the ones that actually broke the law according to Roman law. So... But we don't hear that in the uh, New Testament. You don't hear the story of Titus. And, and again, the idea that we read these Gospels, the lunacy of this is, is that you really think a human being could sit down 20 years later and write a story per verbatim? I mean, it, we know that's impossible unless it was channeling. Now, maybe he was, in fact, channeling something, but that's the problem that I see that we face here in the West. We're still hung by this God spell that still hangs over our whole culture, particularly now that it's it's spread worldwide. But that's There's just my opinion. A couple of interesting things to what you said. First of all, a lot of the way that we interpret heaven, hell, purgatory, God, the devil, and all that is cultural. So like, for example, in Japan, although a lot of Japanese now have transition to become Christian because I think that they, they love Western ideas, blue jeans and rock music, raku music and all that. They also like Christianity. But in traditional Japanese belief, which is mostly from Taoism, Confucianism and Hinduism, originally Buddhism and Hinduism at its core, uh, they practice what you might know I practice is Shintoism. And Shintoism is totally different than any other thing I've ever read in my life about religion or any kind of theology. They actually see life not to be suffering. They see life as a positive, wonderful thing. And that the only time life becomes uncomfortable and, and painful is when you, for, you fail to fulfill your duties, honor your ancestors, do what you need to do for your community. So it's a, and, and that really speaks to the cultural essence of what the Japanese are. I'm not saying all Japanese, but traditionally. So in the West, we usually see the world in a totally different way, just like other Eastern countries do. It's not right or wrong, but the culture that we live in, is my point, can radically transform our perceptions of what's the meaning of life, what's the point of, 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 of living and dying, what happens after we die, just from a cultural standpoint, just from a cultural point of view that can, that can drastically change the way that we look at the world. Um, and then when you try, like the Romans clearly did, when you try to create something like, uh, I, I had a thought that came to my head a moment ago when Wayne was talking, I was thinking, I don't know how, again, I don't know how true this is. I didn't live in ancient Rome, but from what I've read, I understand that the Romans, depending on the time period, because Rome was vast in terms of how, how much power and how long they had power for, the Romans, like at certain points, didn't actually prosecute people for religious crimes in the same you really it's kind of like syria today i met some people from syria they said actually if you're a, if you're in syria a lot of places in syria you can be a jew you can be a christian you can be a muslim there's no persecution contrary to what our media says i was told that by multiple people from syria it's kind of the impression i got of like ancient rome at certain points the romans were actually very accepting in fact manly hall 
my favorite author of all time, yeah. he said he said that it was the Christians that originally burned Rome and that the Romans finally had enough of Christianity, but enough people in power thought, hey, this is a really good cult. We could use this. <laughs> and so they adopted it. But that the Romans originally, they were like, this is Christians are fine. You can be here. It was the Christians that pushed, which it's really bad if you push the Romans to do that. The Romans were like, these people are insane. So, but we could use them. It's kind of the idea that Manley Hall played with. He wrote a book called How to Understand Your Bible, which is yeah. really good. Yeah. And he talks about that in that book. He pointed out as well is that, isn't it odd the one Roman who basically invented and wrote Christianity, New Testament theology, was Paul. Mm -hmm. Paul's family uh, supplied the Roman legions with tents and other utensils, made them what would be comparative today to billionaires. Um, the story of Paul being beheaded in Rome is actually false because there is, in fact, the 29th chapter of the book of Acts where Paul went and settled up in, in, in Germany. And in, in fact, in the 29th chapter of the book of Acts, it says that he actually killed Pilate. Mm. So it, it, it's, it's very interesting when you start dissecting all this to see how it, it completely, as you said, right, it fashions our culture, our society, our laws, our governments. I another good example of that would be if you looked at like the Scandinavian countries, their depictions of hell and their depictions of the end of the world, you know, these are places that are famously like the Vikings came from places that are famously like, like cold and hellish, like unlike, you know, where I'm from in Florida, you know, we, if these ideas develop today, you know, my idea of heaven or hell might be different coming from St. Pete beach, Florida, than someone who lives up in like Manitoba, Canada, you know, cause of the, it's it just the climate alone can change our views on heaven and hell can change our views on what it means to, to live and to die. I think that's a really important ask just to kind of play on the question that you asked at the beginning of the show, Ryder. I think, you know, the way that we grow up, uh, the climate, a lot of the, our culture, that can certainly determine how we, we view the world. And our experiences, um, yeah. you know, our, our experiences of life dictate, you know, what we believe in, how we fashion our own thoughts and our ideas and our beliefs. Now, as I mentioned in, in the very beginning, of the show how hinduism is one of the oldest well is the oldest religion in the world uh, dating back over five thousand years and they believed in reincarnation now when i'm thinking of reincarnation i'm like well if reincarnation is real and we get brought back onto the earth but just in a different body what would be the reason for that and when you deduct oh well if that's the case and that's really what's happening does that mean that there's not any other place else to go right well i mean why would we need to be constantly continuously recycled back here to me that would indicate that there's no other place else to go that this is the only place for us to go if indeed reincarnation is it's a real. trap you know let's Ryder, can we expand on that because if reincarnation is for our corporeal bodies spirits whatever you want to call them then what about the planets earth is a living entity it's a living planet if it wasn't alive we wouldn't be alive earth will eventually cease to exist something will happen either our sun will go supernova but Earth will eventually, some point in the future, be destroyed. So how does the reincarnation story go then? Is Earth reincarnated? Does Earth come back into the ethereal realm and, and, and reincarnate as another planet? Or does it become a sun? Um, you know, my mind and my meditation, I think about these things. And you begin to extrapolate it. And you're going, but wait a minute. Reincarnation is finite. That's a good point. It is finite. I honestly don't have much of an interpretation or perception of reincarnation, Ryder, to, to your question. I do know that it's one of, it's prop, I would say it's probably one of the oldest doctrines. It is part of the Christian doctrine originally. Um, and of course, it also depends on how you define reincarnation. So I, I suppose my interpretation would be if I had to give you one, 
is that we assume reincarnation means you come back into this world. But perhaps like in Mesoamerica and in, in Africa, the idea was you like pharaohs would be reincarnated, but as stars. But that doesn't mean that they were like physically, they physically became a star or like the, the baby son from the Teletubbies, like it became alive. It, it means you transcended <laughs> to the stars. I want purple. <laughs> you transcended the heaven, like you reincarnated as something else or you became associated with this with a star or something to that effect so reincarnation we assume it means bodies but it might not mean physical human bodies or animal bodies or insect bodies it might mean a consciousness that is that perhaps elsewhere i guess rebirthed in the cosmos somewhere that could be as a star that could be as, a, as another planet like, I'm not saying literally you become a planet or a star. I'm saying that the idea in Egypt was that the pharaohs would go to become stars. That's how they were reincarnated. So reincarnation might not be that we just come into a physical body again. And when we die and see the light, that's us being born. I think it's a very new age concept. So it's like we're star seeds. You know, I think that there's another way to interpret and, and, and define reincarnation. It, again, as the Egyptians and as the Mesoamericans did, that you... Were reincarnated as part of the cosmos you were or, or actually you know what that idea might be similar to the the the, uh, the mainline physics view of energy right like energy can't be destroyed it can only be transferred yeah, so it's like law of thermodynamics yes yeah, so it's in fact i think modern physics there's actually a good book written on this about how modern physics mirrors a large amount of what we find in eastern philosophy yeah. and religious tradition I, I think that might be what reincarnation is like your energy gets recycled not that you come back into a body does that make sense right like, i was just saying the perception of what people think reincarnation is they are people yeah they they think when they think of reincarnation and i think the way that it's been depicted is that it's like a an endless loop of being reincarnated back into a human body but I believe that the, the Buddhists believe that you can be reincarnated into animals and plants and like all different forms of life. But again, I think people think that it means that we're automatically brought back onto this planet. And then I, I, that's my question and my point of, of bringing this up is like, well, why? Why would we have to come back here? You know, it doesn't really make any sense unless this is the only place for us to be. If this is the only place that it can sustain physical 3D life, such as the people that are listening to this and such as Wayne, myself, and Ryan, right? If you deduct all that and let's say reincarnation is real, then that would imply that this is the only place to be because it's the only place that That's we can hell. I mean, what the fuck? I mean, that is hell. I mean, it means that this is a trap. There's no way out. Excuse the uh, bluntness, of, but that's exactly would be my depiction of hell. I mean, what do you go to hell for anyway? Well, you have to go back to the Christian theology or whatever. But that to me, you see, that's what drives me inside. And I'm going, but wait a minute. So the ultimate intelligence that creates all of this architecture, this what we call reality, the universe, etc., that this is the best it could come up with? Maybe the idea of what maybe the purpose of what you're saying, right? The purpose of have coming, coming back into this, this world, maybe it's like a lot of cultures believe in ancestor worship where your ancestors are, are with you maybe the reincarnation element is almost like being reincarnated um or kept alive in the minds of of your descendants maybe it's but not you know what i don't know who my ancestors are i mean i've I done the dna but i don't know how to connect to my ancestors because i don't know them well maybe so you know, they walk and slap me in the face and i'd go sure prove it you know but maybe we learn that after we die i mean maybe we <laughs> <laughs> the restraints of the physical world are lifted and we have access to the the akashic or whatever that the kosher record akashic yeah. record yes <laughs> yeah. what actually comes from the book of malachi by the way i didn't know that yeah uh, malachi 
Oh, 320. It's actually that talks about the angel or the entity that writes everything down into the book. But then comes in another thought and train of thought. What if when we die, things are so bad outside of our reality that this place is the only place for us to come to? Right. Like what if everything is just like destroyed and this is 100 percent a real simulation for us to be in for a period of time until everything outside of us gets rebuilt? What you're saying is when you die, <laughs> die, you go to Portland. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bring your guns, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, be, a lot of people think that you know, especially in the, the new age uh, thought ideas and, and beliefs that we choose to come here, right? That's like a, a theory and a thought that has been permeated for a really long time. That, and I feel like it's an excuse like to be like, oh, well, you chose this life. Well, well I'm sure for a lot of people, they did not choose their circumstances or their ideas, which I think is complete and utter fabrication. But if we take that into consideration and that concept that we chose to be here and <laughs> live this life, then why would we choose to be here and live this life? There, there would have to be some sort of extenuating circumstances outside of our reality that would uh, kind of force us to continuously come back here. I don't know. That's just where my thought process. Now, you know, you think about the birth process. So if we're really, you know, eternal or if we're really these consciousness that really never die, never began. But so you're telling me that we thought about this. And and so we're reading the agreement. You're going to go through the birth canal. I can't think of anything more painful for a human to experience than physical birth. It only happens one way. You can't do it twice. And then you're going to roll the dice and hope that someone's there to take care of you. I mean, maybe that maybe that is the point, the experience. I, I don't know. Um, maybe that's why we fear death so much that we're afraid of being born again. Ryan, what do you think? <laughs> you know, honestly, I don't know if I have much of, a, of an opinion on it. I don't know if I'm a, not an opinion per se, but I don't really have that thought worked out too well. I don't know if it's something that I could really, it's abstract. I don't know if I could really put it into words, how I feel about it. Like I, I understand the question. I understand what Wayne's saying. I don't know if I really have many thoughts about that, if I'm being honest. Yeah, I think it's just an interesting concept and just where my mind and, and brain goes is sometimes it's a weird mind and a weird brain but sometimes i think it has takes me to, the, to that direction like you know the, to analyze things uh, from a different kind of perspective and what if there is extenuating circumstances that we do not know about because we're in this 3d physical reality that whenever we get outside of this 3d physical reality we actually get the full scope in the full picture. So then we voluntarily come back. Whether those extenuating circumstances are bad circumstances or regardless if they're good or bad. Well, do all spirits have physical bodies? I mean, I, 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 I went to Bible school and, you know, we, John writes about in the book of Revelation how the one third of the heavens, you know, and if you go by his number a thousand times a thousand times a thousand, then, you know, you're looking at something like 10 trillion angels that were created and all of a sudden they fail a third of them. That means there is roughly about 33 trillion angel fallen angels going with the concept. And did all of those trillions of angels, demons, do they have physical bodies or is it that there's another process that we're not fully understanding uh, how consciousness manifests? I mean, so if we're the only ones that are going through the physical birth, again, that's finite. <laughs> well, then I think 
you would kind of have to define what an angel is. I mean, is an, it's like you're saying, is an angel a, a physical entity? Does it have a physical body? Is it an energy? Is it electricity? You know, what what right. is an actual angel? And I think that it's a that's a hypothetical and, and theological um, definition of what an angel is because I don't really think anybody really knows what an angel is. Well, in the same way that you can interpret heaven as being a state of love and compassion and hell as being a state of like betrayal and loneliness and heartbreak and purgatory is that transition between the two that means purifying. I think you can interpret angels and demons in similar ways. Like if you were to look at a lot of classical demons in the demonological lore, where you have, let's say, Asmodeus, who is, he gives different things, like he can teach you things, but he's usually he rich. He can make you rich. He's usually the demon of lust. So a person who is lustful is said to be possessed by Asmodeus. So it doesn't mean that they're in need of an exorcism. They're possessed by the spirit, if you will, of Asmodeus. They're possessed by the idea of Asmodeus in the same way that you know, we even talk sometimes politically about possession. We'll say people are possessed by Marxism or possessed by ultra conservatism. It's the power. same possessed by power, possessed by their wealth, their ideas. You know, we say ideas and like sometimes our thoughts are eating us alive, like the demons are inside of us eating us alive. I mean, a lot of, and same with angels too. A, a lot of this stuff is a matter of we're personifying suffering or personifying, um, aspects of ourself that we can't i don't think identify with otherwise like we project them externally and, and another good example of this is where the word exorcism comes from because it has a similar root exorcism uh, and exercise so we say exercise demons it's kind of a funny play on words but we literally exercise demons Tra traditionally demons would be possessed through medical procedures long before there was ever like a canon sort of uh, exorcism in the church. Uh, the, sam the samurai would actually come into a home. These were the, sam the famous samurai warriors. And if someone was possessed, quote unquote, they would take their sword and they would cut the air above the head to sever the connection to the spirit. So the samurai performed exorcisms. You go back much further than the samurai and you find that people performed exorcisms in different ways all over the world usually they were people that were sick from an illness some sort of illness we didn't know what it was and so we said that there was some spirit possessing them and so they would usually do things like play music which is harmony which is balance and love and all pythagoras talked about harmony being basically god and when these things would, 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 the music would be played, it was thought that people could be healed and the demon would leave the body. But, but the, the point of what I'm getting at here is that sickness was usually seen as the possessing spirit, and we personified sicknesses as different demonic entities. And when we exercised them, well, we still do the same thing today. We exercise to stay in shape. We also exercise to keep our minds and our mental states in shape so that we're not possessed by corrupting ideologies or ideas or well, hopefully that's what we strive to do that so demons are in a sense their diseases their temptations um their personifications of things rather than physical entities uh, in the same way that we can see heaven and hell as personifications of states of mind so i don't think it's necessarily that there's all these different characters running around in some etheric realm but i do think that without sounding like a new ager, there is a universal, I guess, stream, let's say, of consciousness. And I don't think that you can separate it and say that there's a billion or a trillion of this or that. It's an infinite stream of consciousness, let's say, and we're all just individual segments of that or little pieces of that. Um, How many times have you read the law of one material, Ryan? The law of zero. <laughs> I respect myself too much to read that. <laughs> but but there is there is some aspect of that i think what why that material is so popular because there's some aspect of that concept that is probably universally true 
I mean, it, like the idea of animism, that's probably one of the oldest religious like beliefs or philosophies that everything is animated with a spirit. I mean, if you, you go, it doesn't matter where you look. If you look in like, uh, in the old shamanic, uh, belief systems or the shamanic cults or whatever you want to choose to call them, you know, they kind of viewed everything as being, uh, I guess, blessed with spirit. The animistic cults believed everything had spirit. Um, same thing again i practice shinto within shintoism there's kind of a universal idea at least in japan there is everything is alive everything has a spirit you know even ordinary kitchen utensils have a spirit so you know. it's interesting as well for myself so the gospel of mark if you study the the book itself it's a it's interesting because that is the primary book that introduced demons Prior to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus was not the one that we would think, but in the Gospel of Mark, in every village and town that he went into, the first thing he did, before he even laid hands to heal the sick, he cast out the demons. And then we have the demon act uh, at the Dicopolis, that where Jesus asked the man, he says, well, who are you? And the demon said, we are legion. Hmm. Uh, meaning, and of course, the story goes on that then that demons came out of him and hit into a herd of swine and they drowned themselves over the cliff. Lester Summerall is a guy I studied under when in my youth, but it's very interesting because prior to that, in the Old Testament, we had evil spirits. Saul was tormented by an evil spirit and David would play the harp and soothe his, his temperament. And so again, the whole idea of demons within themselves is a modern concept that we have now propagated to a whole structure of occultism. It's a whole structure of religious belief uh, within itself. Yeah, well, Colin DePlancy's Dictionary Infernal in the late 1800s really amplified that because it he depicted all the classical demons and other, I mean, it's a, it's a dictionary, it's an encyclopedia and gave them Good book by the way it is i have a rare copy of it it's beautiful it's lucky one <laughs> <laughs> you know well, you, you know that book so if anybody doesn't know that book go try to find a copy of it just look at it online or, <laughs> huge beautiful book very expensive but all like a lot of the demons that we like that, that that we see um depicted today a lot of them or i'd say almost all of them are referenceable back to de plancy's dictionary so that was in like what the late what was it the 19th century mm -hmm. like that so like 19th century yeah For a lot sure. of those depictions are just well, they're just like 100 and 140 years old something like that they're not that old um but like whatever we consider i mean demon demons are they come from the word daemon which again divine is divine ones right divine ones right which is part of you which i think is where the idea of the little angel and the little devil on the shoulder come from it's really you you have that angel and even native americans have this i don't know which tribes if all tribes do a lot of native tribes have this idea of the two wolves and whichever one you feed whichever one you feed is the one that wins and gets strong it's the same thing do you feed the angel listen to the angel or do you feed the devil or if you watch that if you have watched family guy peter's got the the devil on the shoulder or something he's like where's the other guy There's a great joke that goes with that it's a cute little blonde thing and then little prick <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We'll keep this uh, our G ready. <laughs> Isn't the the angel on Peter's shoulder stuck in traffic? Yeah, he's stuck. <laughs> <Where's> <laughs> the, uh, that That's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. uh, always a good time on Rider Show. That's all I got to say. <laughs> yeah. So we have this. Uh, uh, we've covered a lot. Uh, here today, I can't even see in the rear view mirror anymore. What were we talking about? <laughs> um, uh, demons uh, have see, demons play a big role into hell because that's that's who's the tormentors, right? That's a whole idea. You get sent to hell, you're going to be tormented by the demons, right? Uh, yeah, I just lost my train of thought. Hold on, let me. Well, let me try by, what makes me think? Well, what do the angels do for you in heaven? <laughs> the seventy-two virgins. You know, you, you get the idea. 
Well, they're all. Was that, a, was that also a family guy or something? The guy goes. Guy said, "Well, they were all men. They just didn't know it until they." Said it. <laughs> they were, they were all like a bunch of nerds playing World of Warcraft or something. <laughs> that, that family guy. Or something. <laughs> yeah. Come well, on, writer. Uh, <laughs> if, One of my favorite <laughs> Family Guy skits was uh, whenever Peter goes and looks in the mirror and he's uh, contacted by his one of his ancestors that was black. And uh, he asks him, well, what's heaven like? And uh, the ancestor says, well, there's a shortage of chairs. <laughs> and he <laughs> just disappears. But I've, <laughs> I've heard it said that uh, demons give while angels take, which I think is a very interesting concept. Wow. That... Uh, if you're if you want to tell the difference between an angel and a demon, you can tell by like what it's doing. If you're being given something, then it's by a demon. If you're something's being taken, then it's an angel. Which I think that the concept of angels and demons have been flipped. It's just like I think that the concept of um, God and Satan or the devil or whatever personification you want to use, Lucifer has also been flipped. Yeah, they're, those, they're the opposites. Th those are totally different characters, right? I mean, it, for heaven to be the opposite of hell, heaven or vice versa, hell to be the opposite of heaven, we could look at it that way. Hell couldn't also be a pit of fire. Fire is light. Like you Didn't the Eskimos have... tell the uh, Baptist missionaries that where's hell again? I said we're we're bringing the family and everyone else. <laughs> yeah, so you can't. It's, it's the, having the opposite. You know, the con the contrary is it's if you have a place of fire and light, that's not the opposite of of a place of heat and light and beauty in heaven. It doesn't make any sense. That's purely a creation. But but suffering and feeling like anger creates heat. You can feel the heat when you get really angry. You can also feel the heat when you get really you know you feel really in love. You say people are in heat or an animals in heat. It's the same kind of a thing. We look at God and we look at these different definitions and versions of God. Same thing with the devil. Like people say the devil, Lucifer, and, and Satan are all the same character. They're not. Satan is Shaitan, the adversary. You could interpret that as a necessary evil like Saturn or Kronos. Chronology, time. Time is a necessary evil. Uh, death and resurrection, death and rebirth. The uh, accuser. The accuser. The devil I mean, in simple terms, the devil would be the inversion of life. So L-I-V-E, live, turn it around, it's evil, add a D, it's devil. Devil is D-E-V-I-L, reverse that, it's lived, to have lived. The opposite of to have lived is to die, that's evil. And then Lucifer is this false light. So in the same way that, you know, anger can make you hot and love can make you hot, both of those things are also, I think, exemplified in uh, the concept of, of Lucifer, because Lucifer is false light, but there's also good light. In the same way, there's actually good and bad darkness. Like good darkness, you could say, is the abyss. Without the abyss or the the the, the beginning of everything, when, when the spirit hovers over the waters in Genesis, you can't create light if there is no darkness. And Manly Hall argues that too. He talks about how there's a real darkness and a fake darkness and a real light and a fake light. So when you start to look at it from that point of view, these are not all the same characters. These are totally different characters. And they're kind of like heaven, hell, and purgatory in a way, because you have Satan who is kind of hot. You have the devil who is kind of cold in that ice palace. And you have Lucifer who's kind of lukewarm in between. It's a very similar, almost Trinity-like concept, I, I think. That's just, that's my view. So well, even the Bible says that God you know, Genesis 1, 1 came from darkness. There was no light. It spoke and it said, let there be light. I don't know who heard that, but anyway, so by that, the very logic is, is that whatever this creative force was, it came from the void, the, the nothingness. It came from the void, that's right. And, and that darkness is uh, kind of like the necessary evil to compare and contrast these things. I've also thought, this is my opinion, and I wrote a book on this recently called Garden of Hallucinations. I was thinking, you know, I've never done ayahuasca, but when I've listened to other people who have done ayahuasca and I've looked at paintings from shamans, ayahuasca experiences sound really similar to Genesis. 
you're in a garden you're surrounded by all these creatures and a snake who's half woman in the tradition lilith with the red hair uh comes to you on a tree and in the ayahuasca experience you're usually in a garden there's a lot of animals and snakes it's very beautiful and mother ayahuasca who is half human half snake comes and talks to you and from genesis to revelation saint john there's a i mean i've heard some uh people uh that i think would be considered pretty reputable sources like scholars talk about the idea that john was maybe high on mushrooms when he wrote revelation right there are yeah, a lot of really yeah so from genesis to revelation you've got like an ayahuasca experience you've got like a amanita muscular mushroom experience the Bible's very much like a shamanic journey in a way, whether that's you know internal in you or an altered state of consciousness external of you or both. Isn't the snake people the Naga? Half human, that's half one. snake, right? Yeah, one of them. Yeah. yeah. It's India, I believe. India, and, yes. And you find them everywhere. They got like the, the, the dragon, dragon people in China, the rainbow serpent in Australia. Yeah. Even Quetzalcoatl is the plump serpent. Isn't in America the pl the pl plume serpent? Um the origins of America and its uh, esoteric meaning. You know, I could be off on that. A Mario. I think a Mario is a serpent of the, the Native Americans. Well, but you're it's, right. Kukulkan with the quaddle. And they have. They, I mean, they have the the adversary of Quetzalcoatl is Tezcatlipoca. Tezcatlipoca is the god of illusions, very much like Lucifer. It's so you have the same. I mean, these concepts are universal. I think that we're dealing with honestly. I think all this, these mythological narratives and all these, like the ancient magical practices, the ritual magic practices that some people still do today. I think a lot of it's just honestly psychology, like in the same way that you have like astrology and then astronomy comes out of astrology alchemy and then like biology and chemistry largely come out about or more so chemistry comes out of alchemy you've got like magic like ritual ceremonial magic and psychology kind of comes out of ceremonial magic because that's what like the magical tools like the wand and the sword represent your will represents your mind it rep you know the, the pinnacle is the body you know the cup is, or the cup is the the pouring out of you know, perhaps thought or consciousness different schools they assign those uh to different elements like fire water air and earth but it's really just psychology it's it's, it's real it's a really and mythology itself is actually a form of science because you're trying to catalog and figure out why things happen in the world and give names to them why does lightning come down from the heaven why does it rain why is there wind why are there floods why are there storms you personify them and give them meaning that's science quite interesting to talk because i have a ton of ghost hunting equipment and one of my favorite ones is the sls camera and when you're walking in the woods it's quite interesting if you think I, i've seen this if you think something's going to scare you you have this anticipating of fear it seems to radiate and manifest exactly that which you were thinking whereas if you go in with the calmness and say well i'm going to speak with the spirit it amazes me how i can pick them up on the camera they become very proliferated within the trees themselves but anyway that's if you believe in ghost yeah i think the there was a science experiment where a group of researchers actually created a ghost like an egregoric ghost they gave it a backstory and gave it a name and like all the stuff and would try and communicate with it and then it would communicate back with them which just shows you that your thoughts and your ideas and your beliefs create reality well it says the children of israel when they faced the philistines that they created goem the um excuse me goem, um these uh clay figures that are alive i just forgot the word at the golem. moment it's like what word the golem thought forms like yeah, the, the golem thank you the tulpas and mm -hmm. Tibet, or paracelsus had a weird name for them i can't remember the name um 
they were usually actually sometimes they were so I think Paracelsus, the alchemist and physician and some of the other old writers associated those care like golems or tulpas or uh, agrigores, which I think is French. They associated those with the elementals. And actually, Jacques, Jacques Vallée talks about them as being the little people, the little green men, which is part of the UFO narrative as well. I mean, and the sylphs, which are the air spirits. I mean, they're they're basically like there's these creatures that can fly through the air. They abduct you and like the fairies, they take you to their world. So there's a correlation without doubt between everything from the elementals, which are associated with modern ele you know, modern elements, uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, et cetera. And then all, you know, and UFOs all the way back to what's that you brought up? It's just this article on how a research group brought uh, Philip the ghost to life. Uh, which what I which was what I was talking about, and they gave it a backstory, uh, the, the fictional character, uh, and named it Philip, and they created this whole uh, biography for this entity and this uh, and this ghost, and then they uh, started to communicate with him. So, like when it's you're wild. looking at the, the, that's an interesting story because yeah. when. When you perform ritual ceremonial magic, let's say, and you do something that's more black and you try to communicate with a demon or the devil and obtain something, I mean, ultimately, you're, you're, you're doing this with yourself, which is why black magic can drive people mad and crazy, um, like really dark you know, things where you're doing really bad stuff that we don't need to talk about necessarily. But like that kind of thing where you're asking for assistance or you're asking for something from some some other entity, you're really talking to yourself. And that's why you can drive yourself mad. That's why the demon in the myths or the stories, the demon will try to kill you and break the contract. It's really you driving yourself crazy in the same way that when you see the death tarot card, that means that you might actually you might actually have a relationship that's ending or you might have a job that's ending. Let's say you can interpret it that way. But if you worry so much about it, you might actually end up doing something that you wouldn't have done otherwise. And you might end up dying because you were so afraid that you saw the death tarot card. So if they can create a ghost and basically like they can manifest this thing, it's the same thing when you talk about the spirit realm or the demons or the angels. Like these are things that we conceptualize, personify. And if we, we see them in a particular way, then they can have an effect on us. That's what all the the magical works all about anyway. You know, something, Ryan, you were saying that <clears throat> it's exactly the same thing when I was in the ministry in Christianity. Isn't that what you pray to God for? You want God to answer your quest, your prayer, your request, but there yeah. is a exchange that is required. Mm. If you're in the occult, even if you're into a religion, it's the same principle. I've told people this many times. My initiation into the occult was 30 years in Pentecostal Christianity. Because within the charismatic Pentecostal movement, there is more of what I would call occultism taking place in the ceremonies than I've seen in any black magic or any other occult practices that I've seen or read about. I just tell people to go to a Catholic church. Well, I mean, you think about it. communion is a blood covenant. It's a blood contract. Uh, the consumption of the flesh within itself. I mean, it, it, the same thing when you put someone in the middle and you form a prayer circle around them. The same thing when you're going to lay hands on a person to receive the Holy Spirit or to cure them, to bring forth healing. All of this is ritual magic. It totally is. I completely agree with you. Every, and in fact, I've, I've, I went to church recently. I, I went to a couple of churches recently just to I haven't been to church since I was a kid. And there's the first no time lightning I, came down on you or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, not burst into flames or anything like that. Good. <laughs> um, but but the, the first day I was, the first night I went, I'm not going every week, but the first night I went, they were talking about the Witch of Endor, which is like one of my favorite stories. But then the, like I went the other night and they were talking about, um, they were talking about marriage, but they had, they, I forget exactly what the pastor was saying, but as he was talking, I was thinking, like, this just sounds like magic. It just sounds like some ceremonial ritual thing that you're doing. But if you do it in a church setting, everybody's, you know, shakes each other's hands and dresses nice. And they're like, no, this is for God. It's like, well, that's what you're doing in, in, a, in ritual magic. You purify yourself. 
the baptism, you clean yourself, you wear nice clothes, you light the incense and the oils, the suffumigation. You do the invocation. Yes, you. And we pray to God, let let this, they say, let this Bible study, you know, fill us with knowledge and wisdom from your great book. It's it's all this. We would say and we, we invite the Holy Spirit to come in and take command of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I could put this, you know, whatever they are, Lucifer in the front of that, you know, but that's really, and we, like you said, because it was in a church, it's completely legal. Yeah. So to speak. And actually, when you say when they say the end of the prayer, they say amen at the beginning or end. I, I always tack on Ra. Yeah, Amen Ra. Amen Ra. <laughs> That's where it comes from. Not sure. a, woman, a woman, but Amen Ra. See, that's what always got me with Paul. You know, Paul wrote in the book of Acts when he was in Ephesus, which was the occult center of that time in that era. A lot of people don't know Ephesus was known for that. And it's always interested me because Paul comes in and he says, well, I saw your uh, promenade where you had the different gods that you had. And then you had one that was dedicated to God that had no name. And he says, that's the God I serve. Now, he said that. And 50 yards across the way was a synagogue. So Paul would have known the name of Jehovah. So who is this God? Again, I know it extends all the way into what I how the occult is so much, or, or, or the religion is so much like the occult. I don't know if this is similar to what or relevant to what you brought up earlier, Wayne, about how maybe the the founders of Christianity, in a sense, like the, the founders of Islam, there's a similar origin because in this, there's a, there's an esoteric story, which I, you might be familiar with the interpretation of Lucifer being cast down to earth or from the heavens down to the land below. And that is the moon God often depicted as, or personified as Jehovah casts the light because the moon is the reflector casts the light of Venus, Lucifer down to the earth. So it's really like a physical thing where the light of Venus is cast to the earth by the moon god, Jehovah. But as a moon god, Jehovah, that's, I mean, the moon is the centerpiece of Islam. I mean, they're, I mean, Allah, which is Arabic for God, I mean, it is a moon-based religion. So is the Hebrew calendar. Yes, it's moon-based, and that's why they, It's and in fact, if you go to uh, Temple Square in Salt Lake City, they have the sun too, but it, they have a lot of moons. They have the, all the phases of the moon carved into the main temple, which is oriented west to, to east. Yeah, it, I mean, moon worship is a, is a primary foundational element uh, within all of human history. Which it's, well, Abram from Ur, the, you know, which the Abrahamic religion, he was a Sumerian, but that's what his family were. They worked at the temple for the moon goddess. Yep, and the moon, the moon goddesses. You, know, you find the moon goddess in uh, in ancient Japan too. They worship the moon goddess. I believe Tsukiyomi, which is which I love is that name. That's a cool name. name. Yeah, Yomi is the Japanese underworld. So here again, you have Tsukiyomi. I believe I'm going to double check that to make sure that's right. But you have Tsukiyomi, uh, who is the who is the moon goddess. Let me double check the name. Yeah, Tsuku Suko or Suku. Suku Yomi. So you can extract the underworld out of the name for the moon goddess. And that's really what the moon is. The moon is a reflector of light. So it is the, in a sense, that you have the as above, so below hermetic axiom here too, I think, because you have the moon, which is essentially reflecting the light onto the underworld when the, when the sun, the black sun is, you know, um, goes into the underworld like Ra's chariot in the west. And there's darkness upon the earth and all we get is the, the reflection of the moon so the moon like the sun i mean it's not just sun worship it's moon worship and i think that gets overlooked quite a bit i smell a rat yeah and you know, i think another thing is like if you if you extract the name yomi out of, out of that moon goddess uh, in japan it shows you that the moon is intimately associated with darkness and with the underworld that's and, and false light because it's the moon that casts Venus or Lucifer down to the earth. Didn't you see the black moon during the eclipse, Ryan? You mean the, 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 the double moon and the double sun? Yeah. I, I was talking to some I was talking to somebody at my apartment complex when the, when this was happening, and they said they said, I'm trying to find the moon. And I said, Well, it's some pretty sure it's right there. And they said, No, no, no. 
They said, that's not the moon. They said, there's another moon. I said, I, I, I was like, I don't, I genuinely have no idea what you're talking about. They said, well, no, they, I read someone online. They said that there's another, there's like multiple planets. It's happening right now. There's like a fake moon. And I was like, what are you reading? What are you talking about? <laughs> it's Nibiru, bro. <laughs> that's, well, that's probably what they were getting at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the super planet. Did you see people cutting these videos? I'm sure you saw this, writer, where people are like filming the eclipse or something, and then like the video clearly cuts, and then they have a they have like a, the video of the moon. They're like, "Well, how's the moon over there if it's supposed to be over here?" And it's like they clearly just cut these two videos together. They get like a million hits on on YouTube, or all we all we have to do is lie, I guess. Make Quit stuff. Me. Just bring a little fear into it and get a little bit of the occult, a little bit of religion. You got a you got a bestseller. And if you don't believe me, you're going to hell. <laughs> That's the way it works. That's why I'm not uh, as popular as I should be, guys. Uh, well, can, I ask you, I'm sorry, can I ask you both a question real quick? Like if you had to define, well, I know you're a philosopher, Wayne. Like, what religion, philosophy? Like, what's your outlook on life? Like, I can I, I do practice Shinto. I think it's beautiful. I'm not, it's not a dogma though. But like what, what do you guys practice? Do you think, uh, do you have, do you have an identification, a classification for yourself? Either of you? For myself, it's like Aristotle said, I, 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 I realized that the one constant in my life is I don't know anything. I have always been a person who gives praise and gratitude. And as I have, evolved. I don't know if you want to use that word. It's probably as good as word as any. Um, I give praise to the one who created my consciousness. I don't know who or what that is, but I do know it exists. I can't give it definition, but I sing to it. I give gratitude and praise and thanksgiving for it because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be who I am. So that's kind of where I'm at. What about you, Ryder? And then I know you got to wrap it up. I was just curious about this. Well, every time that I think that I 100% for a fact know something, something later on in the future comes out and makes me reevaluate my beliefs. So it's always a, it's a changing, uh, it's an ever changing thing. And I, and I think that's the beauty of it. The, the beauty of it is that we can have these kinds of uh, theosophical uh, discussions and uh, maybe change our ideas and our beliefs and our views. I think that that's what makes us so special here. And anybody that is locked into a, a strict dogma that does not allow uh, criticism, does not allow outside thoughts and ideas, uh, in my personal view, is the wrong way to go. Uh, I think that we should always be open to different thoughts, ideas, and beliefs, and uh, not be able to, um, and be able to change and edit our own personal thoughts, ideas, and beliefs when presented with new information. That's why yeah. I tell people I never lie. I change my mind a lot, but I never lie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all you can work with is the knowledge that you have at the time. There you go. Right? Yeah. And uh, once we gain more knowledge, our, uh, our, our ideas and thoughts and beliefs inevitably change. And they should change. Uh, that's a part of the evolving nature of uh, reality here. I agree they should change. It's probably not good to be stuck in stuck in your ways, especially when it's a, a some sort of dogma or doctrine that you're trying constantly to defend. You find that's really hard to debate or converse with people that do have that because they're trying to defend their stance. And when you're not really even attacking it, nor are you presenting your own, they're really. I think some people have a hard time dealing with that. But uh, maybe before we go, uh, Ryder and I are going to be at the Contact in the Desert Conference. We should mention that again. That's coming up soon. Uh, end of May. End of May. May 30th. <clears throat> yeah, how can people uh, uh, get a hold of you to uh, contribute to uh, that fund, Ryan? Yeah, we're actually, I think we pretty much made it almost. We're only like 50 bucks away or something. But if you want to find my content, rdgable at yahoo.com is my email if you want to 
contact me, but the secret teachings, like you see above here, the secret teachings dot info is my antiquated website. And uh, there's an embed player for the free show archive. Uh, there's an RSS feed. And then, of course, if you're interested in my books, uh, Cult Arcana would probably be a book you'd really enjoy. Uh, that I think would be uh, really in line with what we talked about tonight. I actually have a chapter on heaven, hell, and purgatory in that book. So that's at the secret teachings.info, Occult Arcana. Thanks for having me on, Ryder. Don't you love that, Ryan? Whenever I just come up with something and don't even know that you've written about it and we just have a conversation on it. It's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. It happens all the time. I love it. Uh, Starseed. That's Starseed. That's, we're connected. Uh, thanks so much for coming on, Ryan. Really appreciate you. Wayne, where can uh, people find you online? Um, just over at YouTube, R. Wayne Steiger. And thank you, Ryan. I'm going to be adding to my library. <laughs> I think you'd really, really enjoy it. We should actually do a show sometime on my love show. Love to, love to. Yeah. And our writer, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, writer, I'm not actually a star seed. I'm more evolved than that. I'm a star sprout. My seed has sprouted. <laughs> I'm mm. sprout now, so I'm a stage ahead of you. <laughs> well, I might have missed said. Uh, I think I'm a star butterfly. Oh my god. Uh, I'm, I'm evolved past that. Not a monarch, right? Because that's mind control. You don't want to tell people that. <laughs> a star I, then out of the butterfly i turn into a star uh mothman there you go moth so, star mothman well uh thanks so much everyone for being here really appreciate you guys uh everyone in the chat any of the channel members and uh moderators out there uh nina thanks for being here Lori, scotty boy uh candace good to see you guys lost in space deborah uh, and silent voice and <laughs> anybody else that contributed to the chat, please be sure to hit the thumbs up button to help the channel and the algorithm share, subscribe, hit the bell icon as well for notifications. And we will see you guys next time. Thanks everyone.